Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101 uh, for tonight's Lived It lecture in the life sciences sector. Um, just one announcement uh, tonight, and that is regarding the Upstart competition. Uh, we have 32 entries, which is a record. You do remember we have to concentrate that down to 10. Um, we had intended to do that by this Friday. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to make that. The logistics of organizing all of the one-on-one -on -one meetings, and we did decide that each entrant needed to have two people independently meeting. Um, so that is still going, but it's nearly completed. Uh, and we will have um, uh, we will have chosen and it says here in capital F final ten. That sounds like a game show or something. Um, by the end of next week, March the 11th. So um, we're nearly there. Uh, some great, great entrants. I think this is uh, going to be a fun competition. So that's it for the formal announcements. I am delighted to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. David Young. Uh, David was the founder of Arius Research, Inc. And it was the publicly traded biotech company focused on cancer antibody drug discovery and development. Uh, he was the CEO of Arius uh, from its inception in 99 until it was sold to uh, Hoffman LaRoche in 2008 for $200 million. Listen to this gentleman, okay? <laughs> um, at Arius, he was responsible both for the scientific operations of the company as well as the general management. Uh, not surprisingly, Arius was recognized by Biotech Canada, their Gold Leaf Award, as the company of the year in 2009. Uh, equally not surprisingly, David received Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Association of Chinese Canadian Entrepreneurs in 2008 and was a finalist in the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year competition in 2007. Um, he got a start uh, as an MD uh, in 1990 and a Master's of Science in 96. He did um, what's an interesting combination of surgical and science training in the general surgery and surgeon scientist program all here at the U of T. And uh, uh, he made an interesting transition from an academic scientist. Uh, he has uh, over 200 patents or scientific papers to his name. Uh, but he moved out into a company and he switched from a transplant surgeon uh, uh, to a, uh, a cancer um, uh, or a cancer antibody drug discovery, which is quite an interesting transition. Um, he's currently chair of the board of the Ontario Biosciences Industry Organization. Uh, he's uh, the director of MabNet, which is an NSERC strategic network, and he is a director of the St. Michael's Hospital Foundation here in Toronto. Um, however, uh, he's still an entrepreneur. He's currently a founder and a member of the senior management team of Actium Research, Inc. And in what I find a, an intriguingly um, and I think deliberately vague statement. Um, it is a company that discovers and develops drugs that solve intractable problems for people with critical illnesses. There's a fair amount of territory in there, but I, uh, I expect that there's going to be something interesting coming from that. So, uh, David, uh, would you join me in welcoming David? Uh, over to you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, my journey, uh, I guess, from Arius and back again to Actium. And what I want to do a little bit is to personalize the story and tell you about some of the trials and tribulations, you know, some of the things that um, perhaps looking at uh, going forward in a life sciences business is not so obvious. And it's a, it's a tough business, to be honest. But let me show you this first slide. If you look at the slide carefully, you'll see something, and something this, this picture tells me something about my life, and that is, without doing areas, I wouldn't see something like this, which is this incredible picture of snow, ducks in the water, a pirate ship, and guys standing in water fishing, right? So this is not a common sight. 
And that, that to me is the epitome of what happens when you get out of your comfort zone and start doing something that you really love because what you start to see is an amazing world around you. So this was actually taken in Japan and uh, on a business development trip, we had a day off, so we went to Huk uh, Hakone. So what I want to do is uh, talk uh, a little bit about um, my view of the biotech business. You know, this is a, uh, a people business, and I'll talk about the people. I'll talk right away about the lessons learned, so if the people want to leave early, that's okay. Um, I'll take you through the area story, and I'll talk just a little bit about um, Actium. And finally, I'll end up on OBIO, which is the Internal Bioscience Industry Organization. What we're trying to do here is to set the stage for a biotech renewal in the province. So, you know, part of the uh, scars you bear as you go through this, you're trying to codify in something that you stick in your head. And, you know, when, when I think through the trials and tribulations of Arius, part of the things that uh, made it better or made it successful was definitely people. And if, for those of you who read Jim Collins, and I'm a big disciple, you know, the, the core principle to me was you have, to have, you have to have the right team. So the first thing you've got to have is have the right people together. And just as importantly, and this is always a hard decision as a CEO or as a head of your organization, is you've got to get rid of people who don't fit. And the sooner you do it, the better. And sometimes, you know, I remember once letting somebody go, and, and one of my scientists said to me after, the, uh, after a science meeting, about time and everybody is much happier. The, um, the second lesson, I think, you know, some of these may sound trite, but let me tell you, um, you, you pay in blood for learning these lessons, is that you have to be persistent. You make your own luck. And I'll tell you about some of the, the, the cliffs we came to and how we almost went over it, but uh, you know, through, again, the, uh, the hard work of the people I was involved with, we were able to hang on for dear life and you know, make it through to the next stage. And part of that, Part of that is, is, is you have to build, you have to live um, this business. You know, this is not a job. It's something that you have to love. And you got to love it because you want to have something that lasts. So I would say to all of you who think, well, I'm here to flip a company. I'm here to flip a product. I'm here to make money. Uh, don't do it. You're probably not going to succeed. Uh, it's not worth your while. And uh, it's not the right attitude. And this is contrary to what you may hear from VCs, which is you know, be capital efficient, um, you know, try to do everything so you optimize the profits. At the end of the day, this is a, a very important business. We're affecting people's lives. And so what we're trying to embrace here is this concept. You're trying to be innovative. You're trying to bring something new to the world. You've got to be very rigorous in what you do. This is science. You know, you can't fudge things. You can't take shortcuts. You will be found out and you will fail. But again, you have to be optimistic. And one of my bankers just say, well, optimism is what you have when you don't have money. And believe me, we had a lot of optimism. <laughs> So in our world, this is the biotech world, you know, you have to do the right thing. And the right thing to me is not the return on investment for investors. You have to be loyal to your people, you have to be loyal to your principles, and you have to be loyal to your vision, because that's what's going to carry the day. Because you are here to change the world. Do the right thing. You're here to change the world. You'll be happy with yourself at the end of the day if you embrace that. If you're here for a job, you're here to just make money, you won't succeed, guaranteed. I can tell you hundreds of stories how it doesn't work. So talking about people, Arius was a partnership. My partner was Helen Finley. And so she was the business mind of Arius. So you ask the question, for example, how in the world do you make a transition from medicine to entrepreneurship? You certainly uh, can't do it by yourself. And luckily for me, one of the first people I hired hired Helen. And Helen became my partner because she's the one who could see around corners. So she came from big pharma. She did clinical trials, she did marketing, she did business development, and that really was the other half of the business because what did I bring to the table? I brought a crazy idea, a certain a lot of optimism, and a, a high degree of naivety. And <clears throat> what did we do? Well, this is just a bit of a snapshot of what Arius was. Arius, I think, is one of the few end-to-end -end successes in Canadian biotech in the sense that the technology was derived fully internally. So I had this crazy idea, and you know, one of the things that um, that I observed when I was doing uh, transplant research was that um, the body uh, rejects uh, xenotransplants, so try to do pig to human transplants, you get a rejection. And why is that? It's because in humans, there are lectins that induce apoptosis in pig endothelial cells. And the difference between pig endothelial cells and human cells is that they have different carbohydrates on them. And one of the things that happens in cancer is the sugars on a cell surface change, and the lectins monitor these changes and kill the cells. And so 
the obvious experiment came to me is to see, well, can we take the proteins that were killing these transplants and see if they could kill cancer that expressed the sugars and not kill the normal cells that didn't, and it worked. And so, you know, that, so, so that's how I changed from transplant immunology to cancer was to see, you know, can you actually exploit this idea? Can you actually make drugs that exploit this native endogenous difference between cancer and normal cells? And so we um, obviously had a lot of scientific success. Importantly, we had commercial success. We partnered with um, global uh, companies in biotech and pharma. Um, we were recognized, as Tony Kiney pointed out, by many awards for entrepreneurship and business. And importantly, we made money for our investors because without doing that, we can't move forward. As I said, people are important. And uh, I just want to show you some pictures. There'll be pictures scattered through the talk. And um, these are, I see Javier, and uh, th these are uh, pictures from the Arius journeys. In 2006, we closed a finance, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story later, and that was our closing dinner. And at, in 2008, when the company was sold, we grew in from about 18 people to about 45 people. And these are the tremendous people that came together under this vision, which I'm going to talk about. But importantly, people come together not for a job. I think um, you could talk to people who worked at Arius. People enjoy coming to work to work with each other, to work on vision, to work on the science. We believed in what we did. We did things like uh, the Run for the Cure. So we, you know, if you look at the top uh, right picture, you'll see Susan, our Vice President of Research, with her twinks. Um, and, um, and we also uh, played. So you know, we um, uh, played scavenger hunt in downtown Toronto by dressing in goofy costumes and uh, embarrassing ourselves in public. Um, the bottom right picture is a picture I love because it's the dynamism of what happens when you get people out there doing things. So that was a, a picnic at uh, Center Island. So let me set the stage for a second because again, this is a business and this is the business of drugs. So if you look at, so, so one of the things I want to do is have you just stop for a second and tear away some of the uh, perhaps uh, misguided uh, advice you've been given or some of the prejudices about the drug business. And let me just re-educate you a little bit for those who don't know the numbers. But basically, about two-thirds of the deals in pharma, uh, in, in biotech pharma deals or biotech biotech deals are early to mid-stage, so from discovery to pre-phase one. So that's, that's the quantity. Now, if you look at the dollar amounts, about a third of the dollars get paid for the stage. So in other words, early-stage science can make you money. So if you hear, well, you know what, uh, we don't invest in anything other than in phase two, phase three, because that's where the money is. I'm sorry, but you have to measure what your input is as well as your output, and I'll show you what I mean. So if you look at uh, the steps up to valuations between, um, so again, if you look at these charts, um, uh, on the bottom uh, left, sorry, on the left side, these are upfront payments, and you can see that there's a big step up between preclinical, so before the drugs get into human, in the phase one uh, clinical trials, the step up in upfront payments in these deals. And likewise, you can look at all payments, you can see the steps up in between preclinical and phase one, and phase one and phase two. And actually, null numbers go down when you're in phase three. And so part of this is where the appetite for risk is and how you can actually put your money to work to get um, the, create the value. Beyond just the pure deal value, you have to break down the drug universe in a little bit more, uh, uh, in a little, uh, more um, specific way. The bulk of drugs right now are chemicals, chemi chemistry-based, so new chemistry and entities, NCEs. <clears throat> but biologics, the uh, drugs are made by cells, are gaining in both market size and importance. And actually, the growth rate which is, uh, of the uh, biological drugs, which is in the green on the right-hand side, is at least twice the, uh, the rate of small mo molecules. But beyond that, there's a segment of um, biologics that has been doing tremendously well, and that's the, uh, uh, the use of antibodies as therapeutic entities. So when antibodies were invented in about 1982, sorry, um, when Milan Kostin uh, discovered hybridomas, the, 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 the prospect of using antibodies as drugs was always held out and, until about 1982, 83. You know, the whole idea of how you humanize the antibodies wasn't figured out. But eventually, um, by 98, um, a number of uh, drugs had been approved, and the sales of those drugs has increased substantially. The bulk of them have to do with cancer or inflammation. And of course, this has not escaped the notes of pharma because biologics command a premium price, and there's a bigger obstacle, obstacle to entry because of both manufacturing regulatory issues. And of course, what 
farmland has been doing is been buying uh, biologics businesses either from each other. So Roche bought uh, Genentech the same way they bought Arius, but certainly Pfizer's acquired uh, Wyeth and Lilly's acquired Inclone. So this was really driving um, the uh, top line of a lot of pharma. So you know, part of the reason I made the jump from uh, medicine to drug discovery was in 1998 Herceptin got approved and, that, and I saw the, uh, uh, the preclinical data for Herceptin and I thought, you know what, with some of these ideas, I think we can actually make uh, a run at making better drugs. And so in 99, um, uh, I decided to uh, start Arias and I funded it myself, so I was working um, uh, at St. Mike's part-time in the Department of Cardiac Surgery and then using the proceeds to fund the research by renting out lab space by the airport from Cynix. And, um, and really what we wanted to do was create a company that was going to develop these anti breakthrough cancer antibody drugs, so things that really made a big difference in the world. And God knows, you know, I was told by so many people that you can't do it this way. You know, because in drug discovery, you have to find the target first. And uh, if you don't know the target, you don't have the mechanism of action, you, know, you don't have the signaling pathways, well, forget about it. But we believed, um, at least had a thesis, um, that said that you know, what we can do is actually find drugs by looking for, the, for things that kill cancer cells, not normal cells. And why is that? You know, part of the belief I had, and again, we spent the eight, nine years trying to figure this out, was that where an antibody bound made a difference. So if you have an antibody that just bound a, a structural protein, of course it's not going to do anything. But if you had an antibody that bound to something that was distinctive and, and perhaps can selectively transmit a signal, then you could actually find a target within the target. In other words, you, you could do something that you couldn't just with the knowledge of the gene. And so we built, um, with the, the tremendous hard work of our team, um, a, a whole process to do this. And we call this function first because what we're trying to do in discovering cancer drugs was to figure out the function. So we weren't looking for targets, we weren't trying to do proteomics, we are trying to do differential display, none of that. We're trying to find out, does the antibody kill cancer cells, not, not a normal cell? And so what we did, seem, which seemed kind of simple, but believe me, the implementation was really challenging, was to take tumor tissues, produce hybridomas from them, screen hybridomas, in vitro to figure out that differential killing uh, ability, and then to screen the winners of that in animal models right away to figure out which of these cause tumor regression or tumor stasis. And so as, as, a, uh, as a first step, and we did this experiment in 2008 because we did this after the fact, um, but really what happened was we wanted to find out, to formally prove that you, know, you need to screen. So what we did was we looked at antibodies that just bound, and bound of high affinity and antibodies that killed. And so we split them into two, and so the antibodies not just bound to, to a target, uh, and, and uh, we made uh, four of them, uh, some of them of much higher affinity than one that uh, kills cells in, in the test tube, we, t we went to test them in, in an animal model. So in other words, we planted a tumor in a mouse, and then we gave them uh, these different antibodies. And what you saw was that the an antibodies that produced just binding and didn't kill cancer cells didn't change really the tumor size. But the one that may have, that the one that um, actually suppressed the tumors actually was functional. And that's important because, you know, we also went on to show that, again, of a different antibody, that you could have different effects depending on where you bind. So this is a CD59 uh, molecule, which is a complement inhibitor. You can make antibodies that bind to different places on it, which other people have. But the top one was the one that we made, and that one had uh, 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 tremendous anti-cancer uh, properties versus the other ones, which didn't. So this is part of the formal proof of, of, of trying to establish this concept, which again, um, I was told, you know, just don't do it that way. But luckily for us, um, the world is very competitive. And when they're competitive, that means there are companies who want to be on the leading edge of technology. And so we ended up partnering with Takeda, with Genentech, with Oxford Biomedica, with Metarex, with PDL. And these deals in total were about $400 million. So there's um, uh, 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 significant sums attached to the performance of these deals. But as I said, this is a, a people business. And so you know, as I uh, prepare for this talk, I went to look for uh, some pictures that you know, gave you a sense of what was going on. And what you saw here was you know, we went to Protein Design Labs, which is in Fremont. 
And, uh, and I don't know if those of you have been observing, but what you probably didn't see was uh, Arius is about 80, 75 to 80% women. And uh, so this is the PDL team. And uh, you can see that people were very relaxed um, at the PDL meeting. Uh, so that's, and that was a great alliance. Um, importantly for us, um, as you will hear from uh, most biotech companies, there's a pipeline, right? So there's actually a lead drug and then there's follow-up drugs. And so we had, a, we had 500 active antibodies, um, three we wanted to take to a clinic, and so we took two to manufacturing. So what I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a couple of slides is, is the lead antibody, which targets CD44. So concurrently, when we were um, working on CD44, and of course, when we found that the target of one of our anti lead antibodies, CD44, you know, at first I thought, oh my God, this is disastrous because there's like literally dozens of CD44 antibodies. It's targets and worked on by everybody. You know, what can we bring to the party because, you know, we see something new, but uh, it's one of those targets where you, you, know, you generally get a big yawn. Uh, but as it turned out, um, concurrently, um, um, John Dick here uh, uh, was working on this cancer stem cell theory. So this, I think, is probably going to be one of the most important breakthroughs in cancer, which is changing the paradigm of how you think about cancer. So most people think about cancer as, well, you have a, a, a mass of cells that's growing uncontrollably. So you, know, you have cells that are growing very fast and they're dying out fast enough, and so you basically get metastasis and you end up dying. And any cell in the body can do this. But what John has shown in AML was that um, actually they're stem cells that produce this. So um, if you think about um, uh, the idea that uh, you know, one cell uh, is cancerous and it's a stem cell, it'll actually make all the other cells uh, that are uh, daughter cells that grow fast. And the stem cell itself is very few in number, it's very quiescent, and it's very drug resistant. And so when we try to treat cancer with chemotherapy or radiation, we're killing off these fast growing cells. But if you leave behind one of these quiescent drug resistant stem cells behind, you know, they'll come back and, and eventually uh, cause metastasis and cause death. And so the paradigm shift here is this idea that if we could actually target our drugs to kill off the stem cells, perhaps we can get to cures. And so that's the idea behind cancer stem cells, and John has did a fabulous job proving that's the case in ML, and luckily um, that uh, concept extended to breast cancer. Uh, in, uh, in, in the target that uh, identified uh, cancer stem cells in breast cancer turned out to be CD44. So again, you can't underestimate the value of luck because it wasn't anything that we did, but suddenly CD44 became a very important target in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the cancer business. And so here, this is an experiment that sh uh, shows that our antibody, because again, there's about 70 antibodies targeting CD44. If you take those antibodies and you put them in animal models of human cancer, most of them will do absolutely nothing. So ours did something. And what we can show that is that the antibody that we made bound an epitope, for example, that was on an AML cancer stem cell. So in AML, uh, this is a fax histogram. Uh, it's a, a CD38 negative, CD34 positive cell population that creates these AML uh, cancers. And if you look at uh, the staining with our antibody, uh, um, uh, for, uh, RH46016-2, it's staining. So we knew that at least there's some translation into uh, AML. But importantly, <clears throat> because we initially found the effect of this antibody in breast cancers, you know, we were developing for breast cancer. So this is just a selection of um, a little bit of data that shows that you know, if you take a uh, human breast cancer that uh, has uh, uh, no uh, HER2 marker, uh, no estrogen and progesterone marker, so a triple negative cancer, you put it into an animal and you let it grow and they start treating it, um, you can see that by treating it uh, with a control antibody, which is the dotted line on the top right hand graph, it grows, not surprisingly. And if you treat it with um, higher doses of the 16-2 antibody, not only does it slow it down, but it can cause it to regress to nothing. Importantly, again, one of the parameters, uh, even though you know, shrinking tumors is good, you, what you want to do is eventually see that it actually prolongs life. So in the, in the animals, you can follow them out. You can show that by giving them higher doses of this antibody, you could actually uh, prevent them from dying from cancer in a dose-dependent manner. So that's very important. Um, we also um, had a collaboration with the University of Hong Kong. So importantly, you know, this is a global business. You're trying to, you know, cancer uh, here, cancer halfway around the world, it's the same. In, uh, in China, in Asia, uh, hepatic uh, cancer is hugely prevalent. And so in the University of Hong Kong, they developed these animal models where you put luciferase in 
the tumors, you implant big chunks of human tumors in mice, you can image them, and you can see that by increasing the dose of the antibody, you can actually uh, prevent uh, metastasis. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you can see that in the controls, you have metastasis from the tumors, and then when you uh, give the anti uh, increasing doses of the antibody, you can prevent the, the metastasis and shrink the tumors. Very important. And, um, and, and we went backwards, right? So we found the drug first, we find the target, and then we go and figure out the pathways. And so here we figure out the pathways that the antibody has you know, effects on uh, apoptosis through the caspase pathway. It could prevent proliferation, it could, prevent, uh, it could decrease cell survival. And, and with that in mind, we want to take this antibody to the clinic because we thought it deserved a chance uh, to see the clinic. And so um, by July of 2007, we decided to go down this licensing pathway. And so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, what happened toward the tail end of Arius, which was transitioning from uh, product development internally to licensing and eventually to the sale of the company. And the, the timelines um, uh, may seem long, but they, believe me, they blow by very quickly. Um, we started the process of licensing, um, and by November, uh, we had interest from six global pharma. Um, in December of that year, we decided to set up a data room. So, you know, we, uh, again, compiled uh, the data, electronically digitized things that weren't, including everything from patents to contracts and whatever, and, uh, and, and then uh, went out, uh, hired bankers, uh, went out to Canvas um, uh, Pharma to see what the interest was in licensing, or eventually if there was enough interest uh, from our investors to see if we could sell the company. And by May, we had uh, a non-binding agreement from Roche, um, and a final agreement in July and closed into September. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, first, let me show you what happened, because uh, we were on the road. You know, so we hit the road with um, uh, bankers like John Lamb Burton, who some of you may know, at uh, Bloom Burton, so we went to uh, uh, Japan, went to Osaka and Tokyo, so you could probably figure out the companies we were talking to. Uh, uh, Susan Hahn and uh, Dan Perra are vice presidents of research, and I uh, toured Europe. We went to Lucerne and uh, in, in Berlin, among other places. So we saw a lot of companies. And, um, and the thing that, so, so um, if, you, if you look at what was going on, we, um, we put up the data room and then we could start tracking, um, you know, like a website, how many hits they are, and so you can actually figure out who is interested in what? And you can actually measure that interest. And so in the beginning, so in December, what you saw was you know, spikes of interest from many different parties. And you can see the increasing frequency of view, uh, page views on, on the electronic data room. And over time, as you figure it out, you know, people win on themselves down. And I'll have the summary stats later. Uh, you can see then uh, when they got to Sirius again, uh, there was a second. Um, uh, second uh, spike, and these are from potential uh, acquirers, not just people who are interested in licensing. Um, and you can actually uh, dissect out a little bit, and so this, you know, you, you should think about this, right? Because, um, uh, you know, what, what are you presenting? And um, in the beginning, so we, so we could group these, um, uh, the data set, uh, that's in the, in the data room into things like agreements and contracts or research data or IP or corporate information. So you can see in the beginning, you know, most of the parties were interested in the research. Of course, because you're, this is a science company, you're interested in the data, you're interested in, um, in the IP. And, uh, but however, as you got closer to a deal, and you could watch us live. So, you know, we were very, you know, we did this every day. We figured out, you know, who's looking at what and how much interest there are by the number of hits. Um, things like corporate information became a lot more important because that's business, right? So part of it's valuation. And at the end of the day, you know, we had uh, uh, over 26 companies uh, interested in, in areas in either acquiring or, or, or partnering. Uh, 10 of the 20 uh, global pharmas in uh, leaders in oncology by sales. Um, we had, um, we gave uh, of the 26, you know, again, part of it we knew was a bit of a fishing expedition for them, for people to look at our, you know, we, when you lift the hood, people want to see the secrets, right? So you want to tell everybody. So you, we only gave access to data room for uh, 12 groups, of which then um, eight of the, and again, these are all global pharmas, made the trips to Toronto. And, you know, and, and that was quite challenging because you're trying to manage traffic uh, so that the groups don't run into each other as they come, because uh, we were next door to the Royal York Hotel. You know, people checking in the same place and coming next door to areas. 
Um, but at the end of the day, um, there are three uh, term sheets for acquisition, three term sheets for, uh, for licensing. And um, uh, as we were getting to the tail end of that process, um, uh, we went to Pittsburgh, uh, which is where Roche uh, runs a big manufacturing and research facility for antibodies. And this is a picture of the team uh, um, in Pittsburgh uh, the night before, uh, essentially pitching to the entire R&D uh, group at Pittsburgh. And this is the team. You know, we're at Pittsburgh now. There's a big Roche sign: Susan Hahn, Ashwin Gupta, Mandatron. And Nadine Schoenard, Ashwani Gupta, and, uh, and Baldwin Mack. And so these are our science uh, heads uh, doing the pitch. So to step back a bit, and you know, forget the specifics, but understand this. You've got to know your customer. You know, so every company is going to have this. You know, what is it um, that they're looking for? And this is what Roche happened to be looking for, but every company has something they're looking for. And so when you're Doing research and trying to produce a product, the first thing you want to do is ask yourself how many companies are interested in what you're producing by asking them what the hell they're looking for. Because if you don't do that, you may be spending a lot of time and money making something that's unpartnerable. Unless you could raise you know, $150 million single-handedly, you, you, you'll need a partner. Um, as it turns out, um, you know, what we uh, have to offer, antibodies are effective in cancer and inflammation. And that's two out of the six, um, uh, two out of the five um, disease categories that Roche is interested in. So there is a, a, a bit of a fit. But ultimately, um, there has to be something in it for us. And so uh, the pressure to sell the company came from the investors. And this was in 2008. But from the company's perspective, from, from my management team's perspective, my scientist's perspective, we knew that, um, and we'll talk about 2008 in a second, that this was a good thing to do because we could move the antibodies in the hands of a company that's committed to cancer antibodies to clinical trials. We had a large pipeline of antibodies that they're going to get a, a much better hearing with in Roche because they have more resources than we did. And we think that the application of the platform could extend beyond cancer. And again, we can do that internally. You know, Roche um, had their needs, and if you know Roche, you know that the number one um, seller of cancer antibodies, Avestin, is the biggest selling drug uh, in cancer, and they have Herceptin and they have Rituxin, so certainly they made money. 70% uh, of their profits come from these cancer antibodies. So they were actually the most sophisticated buyer of cancer antibodies in the world. Um, at the end of the day, uh, they paid um, a pretty decent premium, and I'll break down the numbers, but it was done through a plan of arrangement because they didn't want to go through a tender process. They had been um, uh, a bit gun-shy from a previous acquisition that, didn't, that took a lot longer uh, than they wanted to. So, you know, if I go back and look at what happened, so I started the company in, in basically July, January of 19, 1999, and uh, we raised the first round in November of 1999, and we went public in uh, uh, March of 2000, which happened to be the peak of the tech bubble. And I raised the first $2 million, literally on the back of a napkin at a uh, golden griddle with, um, with a banker, so you can't do that now. Um, and if you look at the performance of Arius as a public company in, in, the, in the green, and versus the other indexes, such as the, just the S&P broad index, S&P TSX, or the uh, NASDAQ biotech index, or the BTK, you can see that you know, there's times where areas underperform, but as they say, there's a um, bit of a hockey puck effect, and there is a, a spike of value in, in uh, ultimately culminating in the sale in 2008. But there's more to this story than that. And in 2005, um, what you see here is uh, 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 something that um, uh, was, took us to the brink. You know, we, in 2005, we almost ran out of money. So Helen and I lent the company money uh, to keep the doors open. So all the senior management went without pay for six months, and we didn't know whether we were going to raise money or not. And all the employees went on half salary, again, for an indefinite period of time. So I turned 40 in November of that year, and I was in, uh, uh, in Lyon uh, in a hotel because uh, I, I was going to give a talk the next day. And uh, literally, you know, we were down to the last $30,000. And I was thinking to myself, my God, you know, here's a milestone in my life. And what I'm looking at is, you know, the single uh, biggest failure I can, uh, 
uh, managed to uh, uh, achieve because you know I have you know 18 people who are depending on me. You know we've spent many years doing this, and and now we're going to run out of money. And you know if we don't get a deal done, we're going to have to close our doors because you know we we didn't have money from July and this is November. But luckily um, Helen was at home and we were able to rustle up a uh, a, a deal from a, a hedge fund as a bridge financing ultimately to um, uh, uh, financing in 2006 that brought in $26 million. Um, and then you can see that um, uh, there's a spike in stock price again because you know, there's a, a belief uh, by the markets that with sophisticated investors um, there is um, there's validation technology. But more importantly, uh, we were working on two other concurrent deals at that point in time because we were working on a deal of Genentech and a deal of Takeda. So within a course of two weeks um, in, in, in 2006, in March, we closed all three deals. And so that's what this is. You know, a lot of you um, uh, may not realize, but bankers do smile. And, uh, and they smile a lot when you, um, uh, when you write them big commission checks. Uh, you know, we, I figured we paid out over $10 million in fees uh, over the course of various. And John Burton is the banker at Bloom Burton. He's a great guy, uh, not just because he raised money. Uh, and this is the closing dinner, and you'll see that there's um, people like uh, Tony Pullen and Mike Levy. Uh, you know, so, 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 you know, th for them, obviously, these are paydays. But importantly, you know, capital is a lifeblood of these biotech companies, and so there is actually sometimes joy in the market. And um, if you, um, so if you go back then uh, a little bit to 2008, you know, what happened? So 2008, um, as you all know, was the uh, great crash. Um, you know, the deal uh, that sold Arius was uh, closed on September 18th, the same week that Lehman Brothers blew up, which is basically the bottom of the market. And I think if we had uh, 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 dragged out the deal longer, that deal would have not closed. So one question I get asked is, why was the company sold? You know, so on the face of it, we were um, uh, uh, creating momentum, achieving our scientific milestones, moving into the clinic. Uh, why did it get sold? And the, and, the, and the straightforward answer is the investors wanted it sold. And so and the, the other important lesson here is you know, you got to know what's going on for your investors. And uh, in 2008, uh, there was a freeze in the markets, and if you look at the venture funds, you know, people uh, wanted money. They want to uh, create liquidity in their funds. And so one of the things you need to do is when you take money from the VCs, you have to ask some very basic questions, such as what year in the vintage are that, is that fund? So you, know, you think, oh, VCs have this process, they'll write you a check, and you're Reduce return, but you have to know what the clock on this is. And so, most funds invest in the first five years, and they harvest in the second five. And so, if you're the if you if you're the company that gets that gets money in year five, you're going to be pushed out the door in year six, the same as the company that get money in year one. If you don't know that, you don't know how long you have to work. 2008 was a little bit different because at that point in time, most funds wanted to try to push any company out the door because they weren't getting any returns at all. And so here. By being a successful company, we were able to create liquidity for some of our investors, which is very important to them. But again, you have to understand the dynamic of what happens when you take their money. So um, let me just um, change topics a little bit and talk a little bit about Actium. And again, uh, you know, we do have a commitment and a passion to this space. And when I say we, I mean my partner Helen Finley and uh, Kamal Gautam and Kathy Ald, who came together in, in the form of Actum Capital Advisors. Um, again, this comes down to um, building a team. So we're trying to, to do something new. And the people here we've worked with in the past, and we certainly believe um, that there is a, um, a great potential. And so here's the financial metrics of the combined team. And this is this is basically the good, bad, and ugly. But at the end of the day, between companies that we worked at, Arias and Neuromedics, there's a 33% internal rate of return over uh, close to 10 years. And so from an investor's perspective, that's terrific because very few businesses in life sciences have that kind of return. And so you know, um, if you look then at why the investors, or you know, call it timing, um, uh, came into Arias uh, and how well they did in 2006, as I said, we closed the $26 million financing. The internal rate of return for those investors was 427%. So in less than two years, uh, they made a lot of money. 
And so what we're trying to do, and not to be too uh, coy about it in, in Actium uh, research, we're trying to do something, again, uh, that p people told us you can't do, and it's not a good idea. We're trying to create a startup drug company which tackles some very important diseases. And again, uh, we're trying to do this in a, in, a, in a slightly different model. We're trying to uh, create a fully integrated company at the, at the get-go. So again, uh, people will say, don't do it. It's not a good idea. But we think that this is a good idea because you have to have capital. And you have to be able to generate capital to fund your research. To go to the capital markets every single time, as we've shown, is really painful. So let me just step back for a second and look at the bigger picture. And this is um, uh, some of the things that uh, Helen and I have been spending a lot of time on, which is Obio. And, and the reason for that is basically trying to create um, a, a renewal for the biotech sector in, uh, in, Toronto, uh, in Ontario. And, and, and you know, the, the problem here is that <clears throat> there's a crisis in biotech and life sciences in the province. And, I, and I'm not sure if um, it's appreciated, but there's been, over the last couple of years, um, uh, there's been a 40% decrease in the number of biotech companies or health sciences companies in the province and 20% drop in, in, in uh, you know, literally co companies shutting down in the public space. And so it's almost like we've gone back 20 years um, in this sector. And, it, and you know what? Um, who's to blame? It's, it's, it's not clear. However, we do know one thing, which is our government is not spending the $19 billion like the Chinese government is on life sciences, or like Taiwan spending the, the, the $1.2 billion in life sciences. So the answer is, doesn't matter who to blame, we are all here to fix it. So in other words, if we can't come together um, to uh, uh, work on new solutions and new ways of thinking, this sector will fail, and it will fail uh, causing a catastrophic problem for the province which is one of economy and one of healthcare. So in, two, in 2009, 40 CEOs came together to form Obio, which is a volunteer organization to try to uh, change the environment and to increase the chance of success for biotech companies in the, in the province. The goal here really is to create a sustainable biotech economy. And with that in mind, a lot of the activities that Obio is doing it has to do with creating partnerships, so industrial partnerships, uh, trying to influence government policy by carrying on government relations, and to uh, educate. And one of the initiatives is to create a long-term strategic plan that is actually a creation of the sector rather than a government plan through a process we call OBEST, which is the Ontario Bioscience Economic Strategy Team. What's different about this versus all the other white papers and committees that have been committed to this uh, in the past is we try to bring everybody to the table. So importantly, what we're trying to do is bring capital markets, uh, which includes bankers, analysts, uh, lawyers, to the table to plan, as well as academics, hospitals, and companies, big and small. And so for once, um, uh, there, everybody who's a stakeholder can have a common forum to come up with ideas. And so we ran this process, which went through um, uh, about two months, to create a number of general goals uh, that we want to work on for the province as a whole. So over close to 200 people participated in this process right across the province from Thunder Bay down to St. Catharines, from Ottawa to London. And these include things uh, about uh, how to address capital, capabilities, uh, innovation. Uh, importantly, you know, how a company is going to survive and anchor the sector. Uh, underlying all this is culture. How do you change the culture where we, I think, have failed in the sense that we, I think, too often think small, we are timid, and I think we have to be world leading. So culture is important. And how to integrate all our efforts, not be duplicative, you know, to come up with novel solutions that are synergistic. And so we've ran through this first phase of OBEST, and we've created <clears throat> now um, a template for a strategic plan of which the next phase is implementation. So in other words, we're uh, coming up with specific plans of milestones and deliverables, and we're asking people to volunteer, because again, if we don't help ourselves, who's going to help us uh, to actually get involved in implementing and creating this change to create a renewal of biotech in the province? So I encourage you to get involved, contact Gail Garland, and you can find her your contact information at bio.ca. 
because I think without coming together, we're going to fail. And we're going to fail spectacularly because this is a global marketplace. It's an uneven playing field. And if we're not more innovative, we can't throw more cash at it. We're not going to win. So with that message, I leave a, a disclaimer because I ran a public company before, and I will again. And uh, I'll leave it to, to questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I just wanted to, you, you talked about early stage investment and how critical the early stage investment process is. Sir. I wonder if you could, uh, if you could, if you could talk about um, how did you start to make money? Did you patent the process uh, 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 earlier on so that you can use that as a selling feature? Uh, was, was that an important aspect to continuing the, the, the development of the product? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, you could do it in many different ways, and I think there are many ways to skin the cat. But at Arius, we did patent the process of creating, uh, discovering functional antibody, and that was the basis of the, f of the initial alliances that we, get, we got paid for. So you know, by the time uh, you know, we raised um, uh, up until 2006 about $15 million, and we had enough payments from our partners to actually cover the cost of all the capital we raised. Uh, but most of it was uh, by applying the process to create new antibodies that then got jointly shared in alliance with, uh, with our partners. Okay, and just, just one last question. Um, it sounds like Obes was, uh, played a, a key force in, in in the, the development of the company, uh, is uh, did that did, were there obstacles such a regulation obstacle? Were you able to patent in North America first, or in the United States first, or did did Opus play a part in just navigating the legalities yeah. involved in all of that? Yeah. So, uh, so, so, talk a so, bit about that. so o Obest and Obaya are separate things. So these are industry organizations, and these are essentially, you know, that, that my view is, you know, these this grassroots movement is to actually help. The, the entirety of the sector, whether in devices, drugs, diagnostics. Um, from a, a regulatory perspective, I mean, our view of the world um, was very US-centric, so our patents were first filed in the US and subsequently filed in, in the rest of the world. I think the world is a changing place. I think uh, uh, Asia, China, uh, India are becoming much more important. So I think you, know, you have to be dynamic. There's many folks here who are not necessarily in the life sciences, come from other sectors. And what I find fascinating in this is you showed visits to the data room. Initially, it was about the science. Then people looked at the business. But if I'm right, that last call when you were in, in, in Switzerland making the pitch, you said it was the scientists. So would you say this was bought on the basis of the science? Yeah, absolutely. This, this, this decision was a complete science decision. I think the business was to make sure that it made sense that there's a fit. But the, what the fit was was for their um, uh, drug discovery engine. So, so again, you bring up a very important point is you've got to know who the buyers are within the organization. You know, you could, you know, uh, sometimes it's the marketing group that buys a company because it's a marketed drug. But in this case, if you're in early stage, it's the scientists and the drug discovery people who will be buying it. The, the business diligence is to make sure that it, you know, it, it all makes sense. There's nothing, no you know, trap doors, there's no um, contracts they can't get out of and, and whatnot. But the decision was um, uh, probably 90% science. Uh, thanks for the talk. I got back from biopartnering this morning uh, and what I loved about your talk in the past couple of days in Vancouver was the, the balance between the biologics and the small molecules because they were pretty small out there and you're obviously on the antibody side. So what I'm wondering is for your current initiatives, are you addressing that balance or are you trying to, do you have an express preference in the way you'd like to mold the Ontario industry into sustainability with where you think the value capture lies by molecular identity? I think, <clears throat> I don't think that is, um, 
you know, I, I, it, that, I don't think that's possible. I think you know, what, what ends up happening is the, uh, the entire market decides, and partially it's the buyers and the sellers. So it's whatever we're going to be strong in as a province that's going to do well. And you know, we, we don't know, ultimately, you know, what's going to happen in the future. Um, it could be small molecules. It could be diagnostics. It could be devices, you know, prosthetics, health IT. Who knows? But it doesn't matter. I think the key is you know, you've got to have your head screwed on right and realize there's a P&L process here going on. You can't drink at the capital markets well forever. Uh, the sooner you get capital efficient, the better. The sooner you, you start thinking about partnering, the better. And the more you know about what your partners want, the more effective you're going to be. So ultimately, I think that's what decides what's going to create sustainability. It's not necessarily class by class or technology by technology. First of all, amazing uh, talk. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things I was struck by with small startup companies, the, uh, the founders often want to have 100% of a tiny, tiny piece of pie. Can you comment at the time of the acquisition what percentage of the stock was owned by founders and, and employees as opposed to general investors? Well, so um, Arius is a public company, so this is all a matter of public record. Um, the, uh, the ownership uh, division of the, uh, of the company was basically about 20% uh, employees uh, and 80% uh, 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 investors, and that's because the cap on option plans is 20% uh, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And so our investors were comfortable with the idea of um, sh you know, essentially sharing uh, the, the value of the company. Um, and I think that's the right, uh, right call. Um, my question is more simplistic in nature. <laughs> Um, uh, and it has to do more with, uh, it sounds like you were the ideas guy um, initially. So you had an idea um, and then you decided to do something about it. Um, am I correct by, in, in that sort of that sort of perception well, of? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. So, and just to sort of, just a, that's a kind of like the lead into my question. You, you decided to partner with someone and you sort of initially showed some pictures about yourself and there was another um, young lady who, who you partnered with initially. What was, so my question is more or less, how did you sort of decide um, to do something about your, your idea? Did you decide to protect yourself before you seeked out a partner? And what was your criteria for establishing that relationship? Right, I wish I was as smart as you when I started, so I thought <laughs> nothing of that at the beginning. <laughs> so by, by sheer, sheer momentum, things happen. Uh, and honestly, you know, none of that occurred to me at that point in time because really, I, you know, I was in medicine, knew nothing about business. So I just kind of stumbled on as people led me. And what happened was um, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, the company got incorporated and, and, you know, through no fault of my own, you know, there was a, a cap table and essentially evaluation that got arrived at. And, and then, you know, we raised the money and, it, you know, Helen wasn't, uh, was employee number eight actually, uh, but when I raised the money in, in the IPO of 2000, there was only three employees, me and two scientists. Uh, you know, we didn't have much of a company, frankly. And um, and what happened was we hired someone who hired Helen, and uh, Helen was just this uh, incredibly uh, knowledgeable, wise, uh, hardworking person who. Um, out of total luck, because I wouldn't have known where to meet her, except for the fact that somebody hired her for me. And uh, and again, you know, that's luck. You just don't know. Um, what are we doing now? I mean, it's a little bit different because you know, ten years on, we have worked with a lot of people. You know, I have a huge, um, obviously, trust and belief in in in, in the team that we have because we work together through a lot of tough times. Uh, but in the beginning. It's all just blind luck, so just, just which is not that useful, I know. <laughs> well, no, it helps. Um, but one follow-up question. When, when did you decide to start protecting the, fine, uh, the, the intellectual property, and would you have done anything different, um, and would, will you do anything different? Uh, right. With the next so so um, that's an important point. I mean, uh, IP was, is always the first thing in my mind. So, um, you know, and actually, you know, I, I worked in the lab. I mean, you know, there's three scientists. I, you know, I was, you know, doing my fair share of, you know, antibody uh, work uh, and experiments. But everything was done toward the filing of, an, of a patent and claim. So 
you know, one of the core concepts that we maintained at Arius was that you know, essentially no experiment got done without a clear purpose. And most of the time, it had to have more than one clear purpose, one of which was, how is it going to help you in your claim drafting? Uh, so that helped you become um, capital efficient. In other words, you don't do experiments in which you don't, isn't going to eventually lead to a patent, eventually lead to a deal, eventually lead to dollars. Okay. Thanks. I guess this is almost like a follow-up to that question, but my question is, um, I, we hear a lot about the University Health Network, and it seems like there's a lot of really good research coming out of Ontario, but how much awareness is there among the researchers that like, viable businesses can be grown out of the research that they are doing? It, that's a hard question. I, I think um, a lot of people are trying to um, increase their awareness, and certainly at Obio, we're trying to do the same. Um, but you know, the realistic answer to that is every discovery, every patent needs to be evaluated on its own merit. You know, should it be funded as a company if the, if the IP is broad enough and applied to many products? Yes. If the product or that patent is covering a very narrow uh, scope of, let's say, one molecule, it probably shouldn't be um, worked on as a company, probably as a project. Um, but that being said, I, I think there's nothing wrong with starting with a molecule and adding more molecules, uh, either by creation or in licensing to, to build a company. And so the, the trick is, you know, how do you get people to start thinking through um, what you do with, with, with the results of your research? And part of it, though, is you've got to be fairly realistic. You have to look around the world and see if what you're doing is competitive, because certainly Again, it's all determined by the marketplace. These large pharmas have teams of people evaluating um, uh, globally uh, things in your area. And so you are competing with people that you don't even know you're competing with. Thanks.